Diagnosis and treatment of swellings of the floor of the mouth present many interesting problems. Among the lesions responsible for enlargements of this area is the epidermoid or epithelial inclusion cysts. These cysts are congenital in origin and are caused by an enclavement of the ectoderm at the time of closure of an embryonic fissure. For the most part, they contain sebaceous glands and sebaceous secretions. However, on rare occasion, they may contain hair and hair follicles. While they are present at birth, they usually do not become evident until later years, with their growth occasionally being accelerated during puberty. When seen in the facial regions, they occur most frequently in the floor of the mouth or the submental area. These lesions are sometimes erroneously referred to as dermoid cysts. This problem was encountered on an 18-year-old girl who was referred for diagnosis and treatment of a three and a half by a three and a half centimeter mass in the floor of the mouth. History reveals it was first noted approximately four years ago when a small, painless, asymptomatic nodule developed in the midline of the floor of the mouth. It gradually increased in size over the next three years until approximately one year ago it stabilized at its present size. There was no pain or discomfort associated with this lesion. However, as it enlarged, the patient noted increasing difficulty in mastication and speech. Since it was painless, it did not cause alarm. It was discovered during a routine dental examination one week previous to the present time. Examination reveals no limitation of movement of the jaws. A large mass is noted protruding in the floor of the mouth between the tongue and the mandibular anterior teeth. The mass is accentuated as the patient raises her tongue and limitation of movement of the tongue is evident. Pressure in the submental region causes the mass to become more prominent in the floor of the mouth. When the mucosa is tensed over the underlying mass, a definite yellowish color is evident. Palpation reveals the mass to have a firm, rubbery consistency. While the mass is slightly compressible, firm resistance is encountered and the impression is readily established that the lesion feels somewhat like a rubber ball. As the mucosa is moved, it is quite evident that it moves freely and independently of the underlying mass, giving the impression that a distinct capsule surrounds the submerged lesion. The distended vessels in the wall of the encapsulated mass are quite evident as movement of the thin overlying mucosa is continued. When confronted with a soft tissue enlargement in the floor of the mouth, at least five entities must be considered. The first is infection. In this case, infection can probably be ruled out because of the history, the lack of symptoms, and the characteristics of the lesion. A ranula should be the second consideration since it is the most frequent lesion responsible for enlargements in this area. A representative ranula is shown in this slide. It is usually bluish white in color and is filled with a thin fluid that allows easy compression of the mass. The mucosa overlying the ranula cannot be moved independently of the underlying cyst wall. Since the lesion in our patient is yellowish white instead of bluish white in color, is a firm consistency and is not soft and compressible, and since the mucosa can be moved independently of the underlying mass, a ranula can probably be ruled out. The next most frequently encountered enlargement of the floor of the mouth is the epidermoid inclusion cyst. The location of the lesion in this patient, the history of slow enlargement, its color and consistency, and the fact that it appears to be encapsulated certainly points to this entity as the most likely diagnosis. The next lesion that must be considered is a mesodermal tumor. Any of the connective tissue structures found in this area are capable of neoplastic proliferation. And while such tumors are rare, they must be considered. A mesodermal tumor, a lipoma, is illustrated in these slides. These tumors may reach considerable size, are firm and resistant, and usually are encapsulated, which allows free movement of the overlying mucosa. If the connective tissue mass happens to be a lipoma, it could have a yellowish color, as shown in this slide. The overlying mucosa has been excised, exposing an encapsulated mass which proved to be a lipoma. Hence, a mesodermal tumor must be given serious consideration in the present case. Finally, since the floor of the mouth contains salivary glands, a tumor of salivary gland origin must be considered. To obtain additional information, aspiration to determine the contents of the mass would be helpful. To carry out this diagnostic procedure, anesthesia is required. Local anesthesia was selected for the aspiration procedure and the subsequent surgery. 
Bilateral mandibular injections utilizing an aspirating syringe with a disposable needle is being used. Note that aspiration before injection is being practiced, and whenever the depth of the needle is changed, re-aspiration before injection is carried out. The infiltration of the covering mucosa is utilized for hemostasis. Note that the syringe is turned so the glass carpule will be visible to the operator to facilitate visualization of any aspirated blood. After anesthesia is obtained, a lure lock syringe with a 13 gauge needle is inserted into the substance of the mass. The needle is placed in several different areas of the mass and eventually an area is encountered that yields a small amount of thick, yellowish-white caseous material. The aspiration of this yellowish-white, thick caseous material establishes the fact that there is a sebaceous-like substance in the central portion of the mass and points to an epidermoid inclusion cyst as the correct diagnosis. Following this tentative diagnosis, surgical removal of the mass is indicated. Surgery in the floor of the mouth presents several problems. On either side of the midline are noted the openings of the submaxillary ducts, and the surgery should not injure these important structures. Larger vessels and nerves must also be avoided. To expose a cystic mass, a cautious incision is made through the mucosa in the midline, being careful to avoid the submaxillary ducts. This incision is made carefully to avoid incision of the underlying capsule. Incision of the capsule would release the contents of the cyst into the wound and make the surgery more difficult. For complete access, the incision is extended onto the ventral surface of the tongue. The dissection through the mucosa progresses carefully until the capsule of the underlying mass is completely exposed. 